Uh, my name is David Caron, and I'm a professor of international law at King's College London, and I'm a member of the Iran-US Claims Tribunal here in The Hague. And it's a great pleasure to welcome you to this session on the counterterrorism challenge, competing narratives and on freedom and security. The, um, our subject today is one that's arisen in the work of the World Justice Project and at this forum uh, since its inception. Indeed, in 2012, at a previous forum, uh, the work there saw the publication by Oxford University Press of Counterterrorism, International Law and Practice, and a go-to text on best practice in counterterrorism that I'd recommend to you. And yet five, late, five years later, we find that changes in the landscapes of national security and international peace and security lead us back to the topic once again. Uh, yesterday, Kian, who I'll introduce in a moment, but one of our panelists was looking at the names of the rooms and he said, um, I hope they give a particularly challenging topic. Uh, they put it in the Everest room. Um, I do think it, it seems appropriate that this topic is in the Mississippi room. Right? This endless river, you're going down, it's a little muddy, changes shape, but it's always a river. Um, and you're having a little difficulty navigating, but uh, it goes on. And in that sense, it's really important that we return to it again. Uh, we need to always be looking at it with fresh eyes, seeing how others are looking at it, uh, as it is a very perennial question. Our title gives competing narratives, uh, freedom on the one hand and security on the other. And often in our daily lives, they're viewed in conflict. Uh, does more of one mean less of the other? Or is there a compromise that we can strike? Is there a sweet spot that can be found? And in more concrete terms, how does that compromise, that resolution, manifest itself in policies and practices? So I would suggest you may wish to be mindful of a very recent report. It's from May of uh, this year put out by the American Bar Association Rule of Law Initiative. And it's here, uh, you can find it on the web, Rule of Law Approaches to Countering Violent Extremism. The authors there conclude uh, that the most prominent push factor correlated with terrorism is state curtailment of civil liberties and political rights. Uh, one thought then, I think that will come up is does the rule of law, may the rule of law help inoculate us against the risks of radicalization? Let's be clear, uh, rule of law as a principle is one that can and should be invoked on all sides of this discussion. Violent attacks are violations of the rule of law wherever in the world they take place. Indeed, terroristic violence is an explicit expression of outright opposition to the rule of law. And yet the rule of law also suffers when the response to those threats goes too far in its limitations on the rights and freedoms it seeks to preserve. If preservation and promotion of the rule of law requires both our freedom and our security, then a central question this afternoon is how that preservation, that promotion can be accomplished. And we have three excellent speakers. Uh, they will act as thought provocateurs for our conversation. They bring experience from academic study, from work within and alongside government, from litigation and civil society, from law and from politics. And they are immediately to my right, Professor Marika de Khuda. Professor de Khuda is professor of politics at the University of Amsterdam. Her publications include the book, Speculative Security, The Politics of Pursuing Terrorist Monies, as well as the journal special issue, Law, Security, Technology, The Politics of the List. She is associate editor of the journal Security Dialogue and principal investigator of a five-year project entitled Follow, following the money from transaction to trial. That is uh, supported in significant part by the 
European Research Council. Uh, next to her is Professor Joshua Giltzer. Professor Giltzer is Executive Director and Visiting Professor of Law, uh, the Institute for Constitutional Advocacy and Protection, Georgetown University Law Center. He has spent several years in government service and his most recent position as Senior Director for Counterterrorism at the National Security Council followed roles elsewhere in the National Security Council in the United States and in the U.S. Department of Justice. His published work includes the book, uh, U.S. Counterterrorism Strategy and Al-Qaeda, Signaling and the Terrorist Worldview, and writings for foreign policy, studies in conflicts and terrorism, and the Berkeley Journal of International Law. And lastly, uh, to my right, Dr. Kean Murphy. Dr. Kean Murphy leads the Law and Globalization Unit at uh, the Law Center, Law School at University of Bristol in the United Kingdom, and is a former co-director of the Georgetown University-led Center for Transnational Legal Studies. He's also a visiting lecturer at the Oxford University Cybersecurity Doctoral Training Center and a member of the World Justice Project's Rule of Law Research Consortium. He's the author of an award-winning book, EU Counterterrorism Law, and the editor of several other books. He has undertaken consultancy in counterterrorism litigation, including the Cadi litigation before the EU Court of Justice. So uh, we're gonna go in two parts. Uh, we're first gonna have, we're gonna begin with each of them for five to eight minutes, giving a reflection on the topic we have for the day and uh, their work in counterterrorism and in particular on how the role that the rule of law plays in their perspective on that work. And then the second part, we'll come back to a discussion, a uh, number of questions about our topic today, and then bring you in as we get farther into that discussion. So let me turn to uh, Marika first to take five, five to eight minutes to tell us about your work and the rule of law. Sure, um, thank you, David. Um, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. So uh, I was really pleased to be invited and I've learned a lot already from the sessions I was able to attend today. Um, what I would like to do in these opening remarks is to focus on a specific issue that I think speaks uh, very well to the issue of competing narratives. So I would like to talk a little bit about the role of private companies uh, in terrorism and counterterrorism. And I think it speaks uh, particularly well to this theme of uh, competing narratives because you can really tell two stories here. On the one hand, you can tell a story about the way in which Twitter, Facebook, uh, other social media companies increasingly become a platform used by terrorists, uh, facilitating terrorism. And I think uh, the next speaker um, uh, will, will say a few words uh, about that as well. Uh, on the other hand, you can tell uh, a narrative of freedom uh, and civil rights, and you can point out how curtailing um, uh, that space uh, has uh, uh, rights for, uh, has implications for freedom of expression, for civil liberties, and so on. So I think in this uh, particular focus, you see very much two competing narratives that really have yet to be reconciled. So it depends very much on what you read and where you read and who you listen to, which uh, narrative you will hear. So uh, if we think about Twitter, uh, like I said, we've seen a lot of emphasis on how, uh, for example, Islamic State and affiliates and sympathizants uh, use Twitter and other uh, social media platforms to spread their message, to spread their ideology, also to use it uh, for uh, fundraising. Uh, and in the context of countering violent extremism, uh, also just mentioned by our panel chair, you see very much a call to these companies uh, to play a role in, um, in fighting extremism, uh, in curtailing terrorist use of their services uh, and servers. Um, that's not just a case, of course, for, uh, for Twitter, Facebook. We've asked for a much longer time uh, from banks, financial institutions, also airlines, uh, we ask them very much to uh, cooperate uh, actively uh, with uh, policing their services. Um, and that does not just involve the transfer of these commercial data 
to uh, state security services, something which is a uh, sort of topic of, uh, of another debate uh, uh, when it comes to data mining and surveillance, for example. Um, but what you see very much in this area as well is that the state asks private companies um, to make their own discretionary decisions. Uh, if you look, for example, at bank regulation, it's very clear that the state says to banks, you know best what is and isn't normal, abnormal, suspicious use of your services. So the regulator gives the financial institutions, for example, quite a lot of discretionary space um, to make decisions concerning what is normal use of their services, when those boundaries of normality uh, cross into abnormality, when something should be reported or uh, removed. Um, so you see very much that the state devolves these responsibilities for decision making in terms of security to the private sector. And that is the problem that I'm interested in. I'm interested in this question, what happens when we ask private companies like banks, like airlines, like Twitter to make their own decisions and judgments concerning what is allowed and what isn't allowed uh, in, uh, in, in public space, um, uh, so to say. Um, banks uh, uh, and Twitter, they, uh, they expel client groups, they monitor client groups, they mine their databases. So I would say they play an important role. For example, Twitter, who is, which is always criticized for not doing enough, but they, they themselves say that they have uh, removed 125,000 accounts in less than one year. Um, it also comes up very much, uh, it came up in the UK, I don't know if any of you are UK based, it came up very clearly in relation to the, the murder of uh, uh, Lee Rigby, uh, the soldier who was murdered on the street and the investigation, the Rigby investigation found that the perpetrators had expressed their intention to kill a soldier on Facebook. Um, so the question is, uh, does Facebook have the capacity and the responsibility um, to mine their servers, to pick up on these kind of uh, utterances and expressions and actually to, to report or, or to close these types of accounts. So I do think these kinds of developments are to some extent understandable given the nature of the contemporary threat. Uh, on the other hand, I also think that they have uh, significant rule of uh, law implications that are insufficiently considered and insufficiently thought out uh, in the current debates. Um, and I will confess that I am not a lawyer, I'm a political scientist, so uh, maybe uh, um, the audience collected here is much better at uh, carving out those rule of law uh, issues. Uh, than I am, but uh, from a broad, let's say, political science perspective, uh, I, and as a citizen, uh, I worry about, for example, when Twitter says it has suspended 125,000 accounts, I wonder, uh, or I worry, or my questions would be around the accuracy and the accessibility that these companies have concerning their clients' data, how accurate are these data, um, the transparency uh, and criteria of judgment for these decisions, right? So how do they actually make these decisions? How do companies um, decide on the boundaries between normal use uh, and suspicious use? Um, how do they uh, themselves, inside company policies, um, uh, give body to, uh, uh, to, this, to this kind of grounds for decision. Uh, and uh, I'm not suggesting that private companies do this lightly or in an arbitrary fashion. I do think, and I know from my own research, for example, when you look at the banks, they take this extremely seriously. Uh, they design internal uh, procedures uh, that are uh, as rigorous as can be. Nevertheless, from the outside, as a citizen and a political scientist, uh, those procedures are uh, inaccessible, they are untransparent, uh, and they don't provide a lot of redress uh, if you have the sense that your um, account uh, or your uh, abilities are being uh, wrongly curtailed. 
Um, and I do think if we think back this morning, um, the panel on, on journalism and fake news, the point was made that these social media platforms now sort of have the same type of function that uh, state-run news networks did maybe in the 70s and the 80s, right? So we can have a long debate about the question whether having a Twitter account is a human right. I guess most people would say no. Uh, but nevertheless, if we accept that these social media companies play an incredibly important role actually in facilitating public debate, um, then uh, we must recognize the fact that we are now giving them an incredibly important role, let's say, in deciding where the limits of public debate should be, uh, in curtailing, in facilitating and curtailing uh, the space for civic engagement. And my question is, what does this mean um, uh, that we are uh, devolving these uh, security responsibilities uh, to, these, um, uh, uh, to these companies? I see that I'm coming to the end of my eight minutes, so I will actually save some of my, uh, my, my comments and my questions about best, best practices for later on in the, deba in the debate. We will come back to that, and you're just spurring questions for me, actually, so. But we'll, we'll go on. Josh, could you tell us, uh, this seems a good segue, actually, into your experience, but go ahead. Sure, well, and thank you for the, for the kind introduction. I'm grateful to be here for this uh, forum as a whole, but in particular for this panel, and I hope it'll be a, a good uh, and interactive discussion, so I'll keep my own remarks uh, similarly short, and I really do want to come back to some of the great topics that are already on, on the table, but as I thought through how to, to get into this question of com competing or complementary narratives of security and freedom, it, it seemed to me that for folks at a rule of law conference, making the case that these narratives are largely complementary, at least as I see them, would in some ways be preaching to the choir in this crowd. And so I thought a useful framing might be to speak from my experience to, to why others don't always see it that way and why I think they're starting from some faulty premises. Um, and maybe I can say a few words to why I think those premises are faulty. But that seemed a useful way in. Why might somebody disagree with the basic premise that these are narratives that can and must be seen as complementary rather than competing? So it strikes me that one um, uh, fundamental worldview that can lead you down that road is if you see the populations as different. That is, if you see one portion of the citizenry as the population to be protected and the other as the portion of the uh, citizenry to be protected from. And if you start from that premise, you can quickly go down the road of seeing there being a real trade-off between securing the first population at the expense of the liberties and freedoms of, of the other. Um, this strikes me as wrong in two respects, uh, based on, on uh, my work in, in this area. One is it's just um, uh, um, descriptively wrong. That is, uh, the, the populations are not discrete. The government has, uh, those of us who worked on counterterrorism, felt a responsibility, of course, to the citizenry as a whole to protect everyone. And part of what terrorism is all about is the randomness of its victims. There is no particular population targeted in many attacks. It's the randomness that's supposed to instill the fear, the terror, that is uh, terrorist design. And in fact, and this is maybe more true outside North America and Europe, it's often uh, those who are parts of the same community from which violent extremist terrorists come that prove uh, at least some, sometimes many, of the victims. So it's descriptively wrong to think of there being two discrete population sets. It also strikes me as a really lousy basis for making policy, because those of us uh, who, who, uh, who worked on counterterrorism found that it was precisely the communities in which the occasional, the rare, vulnerable individual could be manipulated largely and led down a path towards violence that you needed help, that you needed those who were willing to offer alternative narratives, those who are willing to come to sometimes the private sector, sometimes the government with uh, concerns and seek help, uh, and ultimately in the most extreme cases, those who might say we actually are seeing something that, that appears to be on the brink of criminal activity and, and uh, engaging with law enforcement. But at whatever stage it was, to uh, present counterterrorism as something being done to a community on behalf of any other portion of the population struck at least many of us as a really lousy basis for, uh, for doing counterterrorism effectively. So that's one sort of way that you can think about it wrong, I think. 
The other way is to think about the rule of law as something that applies at home and that needs to be protected there, but simply doesn't apply abroad. That is, if the homeland is the place where, where law attaches, you protect that at all costs, including seeing that beyond one's borders as the lawless zone in which the narrative of, uh, of, of freedom and liberty can be essentially disregarded. Now again, in this group, uh, I think it's probably easy to make the case that that is simply descriptively wrong. There may be different bodies of law that apply, and we in the United States have had a really healthy, lively dialogue with our European colleagues, especially since 9-11, about precisely which bodies of law apply where. But the idea that one is the place of law and the other is the place beyond that uh, strikes me as, as demonstrably wrong. It's also, again, a poor basis for making uh, policy. We found that if one was to have not just an immediate but something of a lasting impact in uh, foreign areas where one wanted to do counterterrorism by using military force, one needed to be able to uh, cultivate an understanding of why one's own use of violence in the form of military force was somehow legitimate and proper and distinguish it from terrorists who themselves are claiming that they're using violence legitimately and properly, but we don't think that. So how you distinguish that is partly by articulating the legal standards under which you operate, which often for the U.S. acting uh, abroad uh, using military tools means talking about the consent under which we operate, the standards at which we operate, the care uh, uh, that we take in avoiding non-combatant casualties, that sort of thing. So um, maybe I'll, I'll leave off with one final word, which is if those are two faulty assumptions, two wrong ways of looking at this problem set that can lead one to see these narratives as competing rather than complementary, they also strike me as, as two assumptions that are increasingly infiltrating the dialogue in the U.S. on the part of uh, the current government, which worries me. In other words, it seems to me we are drifting back towards some of those assumptions in terms of how the government talks about the terrorism, counterterrorism problem set. And it may be worth um, spending a little more time talking about that, but I'll, I'll, I'll leave things there for now. Good. Thank you, Josh. Thanks, David. Um, I think to a certain extent I would pick up a little from what both Joshua and Marika said. Um, it seemed to me that uh, I'm grateful to be here and part of the panel. I'm also grateful that the framing we were given by our hosts did seem to direct us in the direction of rejecting that false dichotomy, um, which very much, I think, emerged in the di discussions in government and outside of government in the United States and elsewhere after the 11th of September attacks in New York and Washington, D.C. But I think we've thankfully come reasonably far from the idea that you know, freedom and security are like two children on a seesaw, and if one goes up, the other must inevitably um, go down. Um, for me, it seems that a better way of thinking about them is, is sort of weights on the scales. And it's the tension between the two, which is a dynamic thing, uh, but needs to be maintained um, if both are to stay uh, upright. Uh, I think it's also worth thinking about the fact that in sort of rejecting the, uh, the distinction, that we shouldn't go so far as to think that there are not trade-offs. Sometimes an increase in security um, will impinge upon freedom, and sometimes to resist an increase in security for the sake of freedom may lead to more insecurity, or not, not increase in security further, but you know, it's maintaining a perhaps a slightly lower uh, state of security, and part of our discussion must be about how secure do we want to try um, to be. But I think that the other um, broad aspect we need to, to keep in mind, because as you say, we, we seem to be going past this sense of uh, trade-off between the, the, the two things, but then there's this pullback. Um, is that there are not only two values or two narratives at play, there are multiple uh, values and narratives. Um, and for me, it, if you think of the scales that I just put freedom and security on, it seems that it's kind of more like a child's mobile with freedom and security and equality and, and, and lots of other things at play. And this idea that we should talk about a, a tension between, between two narratives or two sets of values uh, is unhelpful because it reduces the debate down and then one is either on one side or the other. 
And despite moving away from that, I think in a lot of debates um, within Europe, which is where most of uh, my own research and, and expertise lies, and we can look to an example quite close to something um, Marieke was talking about, uh, where that narrative seems to have crept back in and, and really, at least within Britain, um, is becoming dominant again. And that relates to um, technological communications and the question of encryption. So the framing of the debate about whether it should be possible for my fellow panelists and I to have a, a private WhatsApp group so that we can discuss and prepare um, our panel presentation for today and that that should be encrypted. That debate is being framed now as one between, on the one hand, security, and on the other hand, privacy. And to me, that's really just another manifestation of the security freedom debate and is uh, utterly wrong-headed. Uh, because it seems that on the one hand, there is a claim of a necessity for, let's say, governments or private um, sector um, actors on behalf of governments to be able to pierce the encryption, to be able to get access to those communications. And that is the claim in favor of national security, setting aside for the moment questions of efficacy and, and so on. And then on the other hand, on the other side of it, where being told is the claim of the individual to privacy, whether that individual is myself or someone who perpetrates an attack in London or Manchester and Kabul or any of the other places there has been uh, violent attacks in the name of politics recently. And that framing that as national security and privacy, I think, is utterly unhelpful because it is at least a debate about two different securities. On the one hand, the claim to national security, and on the other hand, the claim to data security. But that claim to data security is really underpinning, to my mind, a wide range of securities. So yes, there is the, you know, the security of the personal life and the professional life of the individual, but we could also talk about the economic and the political life of the country. Um, much of the conversation in um, the media this week is about uh, security um, of communications around elections, um, hacking of communications around elections, and so on. And so it's not, on the one hand, a, a trade-off between um, the privacy of the individual and national security, but rather this more nebulous and messy area where we must understand whether a particular proposed intervention that exists in Britain at the moment um, to forcibly decrypt communications, um, does that improve security and what sort of securities does it improve, what sort of insecurities might it increase. I think that, that discussion, to have that discussion and to advocate for a particular position in that discussion really does demand that we get past this privacy security dichotomy. As to where the rule of law plays a role in all of that, uh, I think I see, I say it as a headline and maybe we'll drill down in due course, but the rule of law seems to me to be one of the values that's in this kind of uh, way bridge I've set up or mobile. And it's also, I think, in the work of the American Bar uh, Association's rule of law initiative, I think in uh, the work of uh, this organization to an extent, it's sort of a meta value in that it may be a value that helps us achieve all the other ones. And it's tricky because, of course, terrorism is an outright rejection of the rule of law in a particular jurisdiction. Uh, if I steal a bicycle in the Netherlands, I am probably not challenging the right of the Netherlands state to exist. I'm probably stealing a bicycle for whatever reason that motivates me. Maybe it is a political statement, but one would want to hand out explanatory manuals as to what the political implications of that statement were. Mm -hmm. If, on the other hand, one commits an act of terrorism, one is very much rejecting the constitutional, the political settlement, whether at a national or an international level. And so in the face of that, to come back and say, well, the rule of law must somehow um, both require itself to be obeyed and also protect those that would outright reject it is difficult, and yet it seems to be precisely what um, the work of the World Justice Forum is about. So I'll leave it there for now. Good, thanks, and my thanks to all three of you. So we, there's a lot of avenues we can go in this discussion. I have a series of questions we're going to explore together, and then we can open it up to other questions as well. Josh, let me start with you. Um, before we, we go to these competing narratives, there is a sense in which, um, or I said at the outset, that terrorism itself is an outright attack on rule of law, and I think Kian was just saying that as well. And you've seen a lot of the direct faces that terrorism and how it's evolving from the position you had uh, in the States. Um, but how does that um, really happen? Uh, so, uh, and let me just turn it to the World Justice Project for a moment. They have in the rule of law index a spider diagram where they broke out the concept 
of rule of law, and one is law and order. So it seems a very direct one that, to a degree, law and order is breaking down, although it's not only random, it's episodic, and it's not necessarily that many people. Uh, could be a lot of people, but not necessarily. It's terror more than quantum, perhaps. Um, but maybe you could comment on what it does to those who think it's us that's being attacked, and what is it that's being attacked? Yeah, so if you look at uh, ISIS, for example, and, and, and you were to map on ISIS's global spread, which was partly a spread from Iraq and Syria elsewhere, and partly bringing uh, existing entities under its uh, umbrella, and you held that up as a map, and then you held next to it a map that, uh, that reflected that index and showed where rule of law has broken down or seems vulnerable to breaking down, it wouldn't be a perfect correlation, but it would be, there'd be correlations there. And, um, uh, and there's a real reason for that, which is uh, uh, terrorists thrive when they're able to appeal to disorder and where they're able to take advantage of um, a polity in a society where their narrative of this is, uh, this is something you can grab onto, this is a community you can be part of, we can offer governance or other elements missing has at least a chance for resonance and it generally has more of a chance for resonance where those elements are missing. So uh, there, there is very much something. Say that, that sounds like an us versus them you were saying earlier that it's not us versus them, mm. or you don't, don't, but that's, it sounds like it thrives or is gr most us and them in those locations. I'm not sure it's, it's us versus them. In some ways, it's, it's a, a collective uh, effort to try to bring the rule of law to places so that that narrative loses its residence. Mm. Uh, there, there's no predetermined them uh, in these places. Instead, it's appealing to those whom I always think of as, as really vulnerable or susceptible to being misled, being misled by a group that says what we have to offer is somehow more appealing, more enduring, more fulfilling than uh, what the state is offering you. And that's where building up what the state is able to offer, especially when it comes to uh, governance and justice and the things that uh, are particularly critical for a state to offer, I think that's where that's part of the counterterrorism effort, if that makes sense. Hmm. Well, it, Good. Well, in a, let me just follow up just one yeah. sense, and maybe others would too. And I'm wondering from political science, that, that seems to play into the idea, for example, that the drought in the Middle East was a particularly fertile ground in those years for there to be revolution or more terrorism. Um, and there's a causal argument in politics that that type of event uh, the drought happened for other reasons, or the vulnerability happened for other reasons, and it's really reflecting an earlier fail failure of the state. But in any event, you're, go ahead, Marie. No, well, I was just going to say at the same time we should be careful because, of course, there's many areas and there's many territories where the state is not as strongly present as, for example, you know, we, we assume it to be and we are accustomed uh, uh, to it in, in Europe or, or the U.S. So at the same time, I think we should be really careful not to equate these sort of non-governed territories uh, or weakly governed territories with, uh, with extremism or terrorism. You have all kinds of organizations which sort of jump, jump into that void uh, of, of governing in spaces where uh, states are absent of taking over social um, functions like running schools and running hospitals and so on where, where the strong state uh, does not exist. Uh, and we should be very careful, I think, from a Western or European uh, perspective to equate all those, um, uh, all those types of organizations uh, or non-state governance structures with extremism or terrorism because I think there's a whole sort of yeah, scala or, or, or rainbow, um, um, uh, yeah, a whole sort of range of types of services and organizations that spring up in weekly governed territories that are not always um, uh, uh, extremist or, or, or terrorist. Even though if from a political science, from a governing perspective, that may always be somehow problematic, I don't think those are always necessarily um, to be equated with, with extremism. Mm. 
I, of course, so, agree yeah. with that. That's why I made sure to say they, those are not perfect correlations. But if, if you do look at places where ISIS both deliberately tried to cultivate resonance and indeed found some resonance, and ISIS is just standing in for uh, a range of groups, their, their effectiveness has been more correlated with where there is a lack of governance than where there is firm rule of law foundations. That doesn't mean that resonance is everywhere. Uh, and in fact, it's particularly important to study the why nots as much as mm -hmm. to study the whys to figure out why didn't it gain traction there? Why didn't it mm -hmm. catch on there? Mm -hmm. um, so I think we may come back, back to this. Sure. But let me, let me add, bring Kian in here. Um, Kian, you described uh, your image was that of scales and mm -hmm. somehow having a balance and trying to maintain that. And that sounds like a very precise thing to do. Uh, on the other hand, as far as policy making, and you must have seen, we've all seen this, where there are incidents that occur and policy making is not particularly nuanced in immediately following um, an incident. And so you get this, to me, you get more competing narratives in that moment. That is the moment when we must move to gain security, no matter what the cost is. And how, how can we, but we know that's going to happen. So how can we look ahead to that moment? Well, I think there's a danger. I always tell my students, do not start an essay with the history of terrorism begins on the 11th of September 2001. And there's a danger of going back to that as an example, um, because it suggests that you as a speaker think that. So I can assure the audience that I'm not suggesting that this problem originated then. But I think that the narrative that emerged immediately after those attacks, which were unprecedented in, this, in scale of a, I think, uh, a non-state um, actor attacking the United States of America, and given the United States of America's military and economic position of the world was unprecedented. After that, it was crisis um, for, I think, the US government, and uh, by extension, to a certain extent, a lot of Western international diplomacy and international cooperation around peace and security. And crisis is not a good place to make um, long-term policy decisions. But one can imagine the position that the state is in it, when there has been an attack, whether in New York or London or here in Europe where there's been um, more attacks in recent years, or in um, Lebanon or, or Kabul, which is that, as I think we've all said, the, the first function of the state is the security of its people and then the provision of uh, uh, other goods as well. And if there has been an attack, the state has failed. And so the state's instinct, and those who act on behalf of the state, political leaders, is to somehow reassure and reassert that that function will be uh, fulfilled in the future. And I think that a practical step that we should all bear in mind when we um, are in a position to comment after there has been an attack is that we need to divorce the response to the immediate crisis and the doing of the correct things there from the formulation of long-term policy. Of course, uh, an immediate attack gives us pause to think about whether existing uh, strategies, resources are adequate. Uh, how did the attack take place? But that reflection is not going to um, be well undertaken in the 48 hours or even 48 days immediately after an attack. And this is where I think there's room for a little bit of optimism because what we have learned over the course of um, the past uh, 15 years is a degree um, if not of resilience, which I think we might come on to in due course, but an understanding of that, of that temptation to have a knee-jerk reaction and the need to guard against it. And what we've also seen is a building up of capacities, in, um, at least in the countries with which I'm familiar, uh, of an infrastructure that seeks to channel that desire to do something into a longer and ideally slower policy process and no longer allows a concerned head of state to short circuit debates about a particular measure's necessity, uh, effectiveness, or proportionality uh, with some kind of instant legislative reaction. So to take um, the most recent um, local example to myself, there's been attacks in London recently, um, low in their scale, owing to their pretty crude nature in terms of the, the weapon reused, so low on the scale of uh, injuries caused. And this has reignited that debate about encryption in Britain. But there has not been an immediate rush to legislation. I think that's partly to do with the state of the executive and parliament in Britain at the moment. Also partly because the national security infrastructure, both within government, within parliament and civil society, has uh, developed uh, a more reflective culture uh, to an extent 
and uh, a slower policy making process. So it's something that I think is improving through experience, but the, I think this, not the simple thing to do, but to bring it down to a simple message is to try and divorce the crisis response from the future looking policy making process and to treat them which they are as, as separate things. Josh, is, is that something, have you seen an, um, a reluctance to do that, an openness to do that in policy making this something more incremental and immediate with a sunset? And I, I think these are beautiful comments, really, really uh, important to, rem uh, to remember in one, how one thinks about connecting the, the moments where terrorism tends to be most salient, which is right after an attack, with uh, the moments in which you craft policy and, and how, to, how to grapple with that, and I think you put it very well. I think there, there was a steady path of maturation in the United States from the immediate post 9-11, which I don't think was a model of this sort of deliberate and, uh, and somewhat detached um, strategic uh, decision making, uh, to a road where um, there, there was a, a calmer response. So you look at Orlando, uh, which took the lives ultimately of, uh, of, of 50 in Omar Mateen's attack at the Pulse nightclub there. and. Um, uh, the mayor of Orlando, Mayor Dyer, I, I, I thought, really thought, I don't know how long he'd been thinking about it, but he at least thought hard, if quickly, about how he wanted his city at the local level to respond. And he decided very early on, it wasn't going to be about the attack or the attackers, it was going to be about the victims in the community, and in, um, folks would, would, would pay their respects to that, and then it was going to be about rebuilding. And that was the story, and the story wasn't uh, one uh, that would be susceptible to hysteria or, or knee-jerk responses. And I think, uh, in some ways, local officials, who often are the first ones to respond, can help get the tone right for the federal officials who are on the hook for um, the, the national security policy, the foreign policy, that some have an inclination to change in the immediate wake of that attack. Um, I would just add that the reason I said I thought we were on a good path is after some of the recent attacks in, in, in the UK, the, the responses coming out of our own White House, I think, were somewhat disturbing on this score. Almost seemed uh, inclined to try to make people respond in just the way you're mm -hmm. rightly suggesting folks avoid. In other words, to enhance the sense of fear and really criticize the mayor of London for mm -hmm. trying to be resilient and, and uh, give a sense of calm. And, and that is, strikes me as part of the backtracking that I worry about. So Marika, I think this is taking us to your area. <laughs> Uh, and, and more about politics and uh, a study of populations. But in, in our title to this, in the description of this panel, one of the phrases was a citizen's sense of national security, a, a sense of personal security. And as Kian pointed out, the attacks are horrific in London. On the other hand, they could have been much more horrific. And there was a certain pride in Britain about how they were resilient, um, even though this is testing that. Um, but do countries vary in this quality of resilience, just going on with things? Um, is it some expectation about how perfect security can be? Um, and I think Joshua brought up a very good point that leaders could, for a variety of reasons, turn that resilience, either turn it up or decrease it. Yeah, I mean, I think in security studies, it's really quite widely accepted that security is, is, is subjective, is about feeling secure, is about uh, perceptions of security, uh, m much more even than, um, than sort of an objective uh, state of security. And I do think it's important to, uh, to, to point out, or, or I have very much a question about prediction and, and reliable knowledge. So I think it is very, very difficult to produce reliable knowledge uh, in the field of terrorism studies. Uh, it's a very politicized uh, field of research. Um, and I think we can, well, we know a lot about past attacks and we can really study past attacks and there's uh, also very good reports. Um, but there's always this sort of desire to predict. 
uh, and there's always this desire to secure uh, for the future and uh, this, the sense that we may predict uh, where uh, an attack may happen next or, um, or who uh, will be the next perpetrator. And there I think uh, we d politics has a responsibility to be, uh, to be realistic uh, and to uh, somehow not let those expectations uh, get out of hand. Uh, so if you look at some of the recent perpetrators, I think all the recent perpetrators in the UK, but also, for example, France and Belgium, they were known to security services. Um, so these were people who radicalized uh, really quickly, uh, but they were, they were already somehow on the radar to secure, of security services. They were somehow known, uh, but they were always seen as kind of marginal figures, figures that were not, uh, let's say, at risk of immediately um, uh, acting. Um, and so knowing that in retrospect, does it mean that we can say that security services failed? Well, I'm not so sure, uh, because uh, do, you know, do you work with an assumption that we can monitor everyone, that we can survey everyone, that you can uh, keep an eye on even those figures that are um, considered to be marginal? And I think those are really huge questions for, for, uh, for, for politicians, for policymakers, uh, for open societies, for people who, uh, who are concerned with the rule of law. Um, and I think uh, Kian said something uh, interesting earlier when you say, when you said that when there is an attack, um, the state has failed. But in a way, I wonder if that's always the case. Um, uh, I think when there's an attack, there's the quick perception that the state has failed or that security services have failed. But that also has something to do with the expectations that we have uh, and the expectations that citizens have in terms of uh, a, a perfect security or 100% security. And I do think that that speaks to the theme of resilience in the sense that maybe we cannot expect 100% um, security. Um, and I think actually when you speak to uh, policymakers and professionals, they are often very aware also of the downsides and the problematic nature of some of counterterrorism uh, policies. Um, but politicians, I think, are not always so courageous to, um, uh, to engage those downsides explicitly and to actually um, uh, spread the message that 100% security maybe is not uh, possible. Uh, politicians are always afraid that they're the ones who are uh, in the seat when the next attack happens. And that sometimes uh, leads to a very risk-averse kind of precautionary um, way of doing counterterrorism that that I think has the ability to be counterproductive. And that that seems to be going back to this question, uh, sort of your correlation point about where is it that the leader over invokes the threat of terrorism, and really why are they doing it? Why aren't they saying we can't have perfect security and trying to build a more resilient society? Um, I, I think there's some ideas already about viewing this uh, competing narratives in a different way. Um, but I'd like to turn toward uh, asking you about innovations, possible ways to think about approaching this as you see it uh, come up. And um, so, uh, you know, I, I th one thought that occurs to me, we, I think as lawyers, we're, we see more the failure of the measure taken right at the outset that it overreaches somehow and cuts back into some freedoms that were given to us. Uh, and then the lawyers react with litigation and the end result actually may be a measure that is balanced. Um, but we, we live through that battle so much that it seems perhaps more contentious, but it is a mechanism, a very costly mechanism to reach an outcome uh, of a more finely tuned mechanism more finely measured. Uh, the question I have, is there something we can do before that mechanism, before the measure comes out that just overreaches in some way? And uh, some suggestions that were given is uh, some examples. There is the Office of the UN Ombudsperson who reviews imposition of sanction on suspected terrorists. So the, the, they've been put on the list, but perhaps they shouldn't be on the list. Um, or the UK independent reviewer of terrorism legislation who comments on it. Um, but how could we get 
uh, some accountability, some way of addressing some of these, of an overreach before it reaches, uh, before we have to go through litigation, or all, it's imposed already and already causing damage. Joshua? Well, a couple of uh, thoughts on that. One is to have a, a healthier public debate rather than to produce a legislative item quickly in the wake of an attack somewhat out of the blue. So that's a, that would, the latter would be my characterization of how the Patriot Act, for example, emerged post 9-11. Whereas, if you look at the public conversation, at least in the United States, that led to what was called, I think, the USA Freedom Act that took the bulk telephone metadata uh, collection program and reoriented it so that the government was not storing the bulk data. Instead, that data was sitting with the companies and instead the uh, executive branch was taking to the FISA court specific requests and if the FISA court approved those, then those specific requests would go to the companies. That was a very interesting public debate and it yielded a, 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 a law that uh, I think strikes a, a decent balance between um, what are sometimes uh, trade-offs, even if the narratives I don't think are at odds with each other, there are particular issues that are trade-offs. So that kind of robust public debate, rather than here's the law, it's passed, and now litigated, I think is probably a, a smarter, uh, sager way to, to, um, uh, to move these things forward. The other piece is even just within the government. Part of what we saw in the early days of this administration was a, a first travel ban come out that, as the papers reported, had not received vetting even across the, the uh, professional expertise of its own government, which is what led to, in some ways, dramatic changes even to the second one, which I still find problematic. But you saw a whole country dropped, uh, which presumably is, is, it was based on different folks putting their input, uh, contributing their input to the process. So uh, I think it's also important to just reach within governments at this point, which have built up a, a wealth of expertise on what actually contributes to keeping citizens safer, um, rather than, um, to your point earlier, letting some of the political impulses generate policy in this area. Kian, does this, does the UK independent reviewer, does that generate public deba debate? Is it? Uh... I, I think so to, to speak more broadly for a moment and then come to that specific mm -hmm. example, um, as a constitutional lawyer one is always a bit hesitant when someone proposes a new innovative office, whether it's the UN Ombudsperson or the Independent Reviewer, which sits outside our classic tripartite vision of government and somehow does a quasi version of what one of those institutions would do. I think in both those examples um, that you give, the um, the most recent, not the current, but uh, the most recent office holders, David Anderson in the UK and uh, Kim Pross at the UN, doing two very different jobs, it should be stressed, but both examples of innovative office making and counterterrorism. They did excellent work within the boundaries of what their positions permitted, including pushing at those boundaries. Um, and if we judge those offices on the basis of what those office holders did with them, um, then it is, uh, they're good offices, they're helpful. I'm not saying I would wholeheartedly endorse them, but compared to the absence of those offices, um, they've been a good thing. Now the danger is because their office is essentially of one person plus people who work for them, you know, below the scenes but without direct responsibility, rather than institutions, I don't know that it's as easy to build up a system, a culture, um, of behaving in a particular way to ensure that you get that institutional memory, which you should ideally have um, in, uh, let's say, an executive, for example. Joshua, before we convened here, told us that he was asked by the current US administration to stay on for some time to help that, that change. You can try and do that with an office of one, but it's, it's much more difficult. So I think, as a constitutional lawyer, I'm suspicious of, of novelties. Maybe we're a bit of a fuddy-duddy wing of law, I don't know. Um, and. Uh, positive about how certain office holders use them, but I think uh, given that the recent history has shown that the traditional tripartite division of government is not functioning well without these props in some way, I think we have to put energy in somewhere, and if these, if these additional offices are where we have, then uh, let's use them. I think where I would have much more complicated things to say would be as if we were to get into some of the and Kim Prost is an example to an extent of this, the displacement of the judicial function and that, that being given to something else or the displacement of judicial due process in, let's say, UK law and that, that function being somehow watered down. That's where it gets a bit more difficult, I think, these innovations. 
Can I answer that? Yes, yes. absolutely. Because I, um, I, I do think we also have to really see the limits, especially if we use the, the, office, the UN Office of the Ombudsperson as an example. Um, it's being held up as an example that after maybe 10 years or more of litigation addresses some of the downsides of uh, UN Security Council blacklisting measures. That's, you know, that's how it was instituted. Um, but you can also think about it as being very little, very late. It took mm. a very long time for this uh, ombudsperson to, to, to be in place, right? This is for people who are blacklisted, who have no means to have their case heard, who have no, uh, uh, who had no way to, to petition and, and, and to seek redress. And I do think, at the same time, I mean, I share your admiration of what the people who are in office have done with it. Nevertheless, the constraints of the office of the ombudsperson are considerable. Mm -hmm. uh, this person does not review uh, the actual materials that got someone listed in the first place. Uh, 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 she does not hold hearings that are remotely comparable to the kind of hearings that you would have if you were, for example, doing a criminal law uh, type case. Mm -hmm. so, so, so I also share some of the suspicion mm -hmm. around these novel institutions. I'm not a lawyer, <laughs> but, um, but but I do think also, especially from a legal point of view, uh, these hybrid new institutions are, um, well, maybe they need, still need to grow, but they also have very considerable uh, limits uh, and, and, and scope. So, so I would share a lot of suspicion there. Yeah. I, I think as well, if you, so, think, sorry, David, if you think about it from the point of view of the system and organization, set yourself outside it, you can say, well, look, over a certain period of time, the system has learned and improved. And you could give examples of legislation as well that has been improved through litigation, as you said. If you look at it from the point of view of the individual who's subject to something which is later proven to be unlawful, um, then 10 years is a very long time to wait for you know, the system to get it right and for your rights to be restored to the situation they should have been at the outset had the system been better set up from the outset. So there's a lot of discussion kind of progressive contemporary constitutional debate about you know, reflexive constitutionalism. We're learning the whole time. But that's fine in, in our, I think, our classrooms and, and our research offices, but for the people who are subject to the provisions, it's a lot harder to take, I think. That seems to run against your notion that there's a set of scales or that they're complementary. Mm. I mean, if you're looking from the perspective of the individual, mm. then it's not complementary. Uh, I think that's Marika's point. That's a long time for that individual. Uh, let's, let's go to Marika's topic for a moment, your, your partnership, the, pri the role of the private companies. But I think this example we've had of the ombudsman, in a way, from the lawyer's perspective, this is the difficulty of, it would be difficult to do that listing in a country and not have follow-on litigation uh, with someone seeing the records. Uh, on the other hand, it's given to the United Nations, and then it seems beyond any of those uh, review processes. Um, so here, either some tasks are being given to private entities, mm -hmm. or private entities are being asked to cooperate. Um, and just, could you comment more on how those partnerships are going mm -hmm. and what your work is showing? Yeah, and I think um, uh, there, there is a lot going on in that area. Um, I think if you, if you think, for example, about uh, the discussions in relation to the financial industry, there's huge discussions now, and, and, and I'm sure some of you have heard about it, concerning what's called de-risking, where uh, banks and financial institutions have been asked for so long uh, to mine their databases for potential relations to terrorists or terrorist suspects or terrorist groups that, that some banks and some countries have now actually started uh, debanking entire client groups. So they say particular types of client groups, for example, um, money surface um, uh, operations to Somalia, banks have said we can just not provide banking services to these types of clients it's too risky, we cannot fulfill our uh, obligations that uh, the Financial Action Task Force uh, asks of us, or OFAC, uh, the US Office of Foreign Assets Control, for example, has given huge fines to some European banks. And so now you see that some banks, I think, 
to some extent understandably, have started shunning these client groups. And this can cause huge problems, right? So uh, if, uh, if you cannot bank, you cannot uh, live a meaningful life in Western society, but it also causes huge problems to nonprofit organizations, for example, trying to remit money, including to Syria. I mean, there, there is UN evidence that uh, remitting money to Syria, even for humanitarian uh, reasons, is uh, almost impossible at the moment, even for the big uh, uh, nonprofits like uh, Oxfam, Red Cross, uh, or Cordate, actually here in The Hague, uh, are, um, are working on this issue. So here you see very much some of the long-term uh, side effects uh, of uh, counterterrorism measures. The one hope we have is that there is now quite a good dialogue. So there is quite a good dialogue uh, getting off the ground, which includes the private sector. So if you speak to people at banks, they are very much concerned about this as well. Uh, uh, people at the Finance, uh, Financial Action Task Force are concerned about this. So there's a shared recognition that this is a problem. Um, which is a good thing. This is some of the dialogue you were talking about earlier. At the same time, that shared recognition sort of leads to what uh, can be called like a hot potato problem in the sense that everybody is passing responsibility. The banks are saying, well, you know, this is what the law wants of us. Uh, the regulator uh, is saying, well, this is not what we meant. The banks are doing it wrongly. Uh, the Financial Action Task Force, uh, which makes some of the, the rules, uh, is also saying this is not, you know, this is a wrong interpretation of our rules. So you see a serious problem that is recognized to be a serious problem arising in this field, precisely by devolving responsibility to private institutions. You see that all the partners in this field recognize that it's a problem, but what we don't yet see is actually a sense of responsibility, uh, not even a shared sense of responsibility as to where the, the, the solution should come from. And I do think, yeah, that's the next step that, that we're sort of uh, waiting for and that we really need. And that, I do think that next step lies very much in dialogue, right? So it is a sense of, you see platforms of dialogue confidential dialogue emerging where the regulator, the private institution, the lawmaker, the international body, if they are involved, actually start building a platform for dialogue. And I do think that that's where the solution lies. But in this area, again, it's, it's very little, very late, uh, because, yeah, this problem has been known and it's exacerbated in the last five to ten years, uh, rather than um, being, being addressed. So what, one last question before we, go to, before we go to questions from the audience, and that is, um, that would have seemed like a perfect area for civil society hmm. to somehow have a bank that, uh, non-profit non bank, if such a thing could exist, hmm. that would uh, remit these funds, that would push at what the supposed interpretation uh, being offered is, uh, and uh, do it solely for that purpose. And many members of this, forum come from civil society, from think tanks, and I, I think their question is what, what role do we have in this uh, area? And I don't know if you have any comments anyone you'd like to offer on that. Well, I, so I think this is, and Marek has written about it more, more extensively than I have, but there are of course informal remittance systems that have worked quite effectively for people living in the United Kingdom or the United States to send money to parts of the world from which they have come. Um, I think back when Irish people were flying around the world, you just put cash in the post. Now, now it's different. The problem is that these informal remittance services, I think, have been, in some respects, crushed by the burden of regulation. The, just the sheer volume of regulatory compliance that's required to keep operating, I think, even on the assumption that they are operating entirely in compliance with the law, and there's, there's nothing nefarious. Um, has made it very, very difficult for them. And I know there are examples in the academic literature alone, let alone in kind of the in broader discussion where we have people who may have first-hand knowledge. But there are examples of, of for, um, forums or forms of uh, money transfer that have just closed because they haven't been able to do that. Um, yeah. So I think one would need a lot behind your non-profit bank to, to cope. To pull that off. So I believe there's a microphone here. Um, if there are questions, there's one to the right there. And there's several. So why don't you go to the right uh, quickly? She had her hand up first. If you could identify yourself 
uh, briefly? Um, my name is Sharon Gerstmann. I'm from the United States. Um, so my question is that so far you've talked about, in, in the, whether you talk about the scales or seesaw uh, freedom and safety, but you seem to lump all freedoms together. And I wonder if there's been some um, analysis done about which freedoms uh, societies are more willing to give up. Mm -hmm. I mean, in, in the United States, I think it's, it's sort of surprising to me that people are willing to give up their First Amendment rights and their privacy rights, but they would never give up their Second Amendment rights to, to uh, have gun regulation. And so I wonder if there's any, any analysis that's been done. Uh, it's an excellent observation. It does seem we could break apart the, the, the freedoms that are being infringed upon. Uh, does anyone know of any analysis? Or? As you asked the question, my, my uh, mind went to exactly the example you then went to, which was uh, at least from somebody who was charged with trying to keep, uh, keep Americans safe from terrorism as a form of, of, of violence. Uh, I had some hope that uh, Orlando in particular, and the rather startling death count there, it was, it was 50 ultimately when one of the victims succumbed to, to wounds later at the hospital, occurred from uh, essentially a, a, roughly a, a single actor, at least in, in the moment, um, with, with access to um, some weapons that obviously did some serious damage. And it, uh, it did lead to some conversations about the continued ease with which those types of weapons can be acquired, even by folks who have had encounters with law enforcement along the way. Um, but at least, uh, f uh, to, to my sense, it didn't really change the conversation, which I think is unfortunate because it's, um, it could be a piece of the different ways in which one tries to protect a citizenry from those rare individuals who want to do something like that attack. A piece is obviously identifying the individuals. A piece is convincing folks that there should be no such desire to have an attack like that in the first place. But a piece could also be keeping away the weapons that enable a death count to go from something lower to a, a death count like that. And unfortunately, it didn't seem to move the conversation. But um, uh, it, it, I do think it's a reason that you see numbers like that in comparison to numbers in attacks, let's say, in Europe, which um, sometimes don't involve, uh, involve cruder weapons and thus give more of a time for law enforcement or others, just citizenry, to involve before more lives are taken. Yeah. No, I can't say I've seen research either. But I think of the various rights that are out there, the one in, about which we are having the most difficult conversation at the moment is privacy on both sides of the Atlantic. There seems to be all sorts of strange relationships that we have to the idea as individuals and as groups um, in terms of sometimes willing to give up information, other times not. And uh, I think if, if you ask people, if you gave people a menu of their rights and asked them at different times what rights were more valuable to them, you know, it could depend on what they read in the news that morning as to how much or how little they valued or seemed to value the right to privacy. Um, equally, there's a, a belief, I think, in um, at least some circles of constitutional lawyers that privacy is valued much more on this side of the Atlantic than on the other side of the Atlantic. Um, even within some countries in Europe, uh, privacy seems to be legally protected much more strongly. And yet, when you do comparative constitutional law work with scholars, you'll find on some areas, like some certain aspects of national security, the United States provides much more robust protections for privacy than the European system seems to. So it's, I think that's a right about which we are trying to have a conversation within and across countries at the moment that um, we don't seem to have any strong rational purchase on. Um, the Second Amendment right one is, I think, peculiar to one particular jurisdiction and doesn't arise so much on this side of the Atlantic, yeah. for which I am very grateful, of course. But I, I, I think that discussion is important in terms of it, as you go home, it does, in, does suggest this is a highly contextual thing to think about, about your political system, about your, the freedoms that you recognize, to what degree in your country. Yesterday there were panels uh, that pointed to a restriction of freedom of expression, freedom of assembly. Um, at the same time that Josh is suggesting one answer is greater political engagement yeah. with getting the right balance in the measures. There was a question down front, and then we'll circle back uh, to the middle of the room. Thank you very much, uh, Daoud Sultanzoui from Afghanistan. Um, I, uh, it's a very interesting discussion, but I think when you talk about counterterrorism, it may be necessary to talk about uh, the root causes of terrorism, uh, especially coming from Afghanistan, I'm sure the people over there would like to know, because it's a country that uh, 
did not produce terrorists uh, until the Taliban was created. And then, of course, uh, the war of ter against terror is being fought in Afghanistan while terrorists are coming from other countries. Uh, and then we don't have the right to bear arms in our constitution. It's not allowed. And yet, that region is uh, the most profitable region in terms of uh, arms sales. Um, uh, the, the, the second uh, thing that I wanted to address was uh, the discussion was uh, here about uh, governance, lack of rule of law, or weak governments. In Afghanistan, and at least in Iraq, it is weak governance and lack of rule of law that has created the void that was felt by terrorists. Uh, while uh, that weak government and lack of rule of law may not be the cause of terrorism, but it creates a very fertile ground for it to grow. So mm -hmm. I think uh, uh, it, I'm a liberal uh, a citizen of the world, but if this discussion was heard in Afghanistan or in the part of the world where uh, 150, 200 people die every day. They may think that this is a very nice academic discussion, but it will very, sound very aloof to them unless we talk about the cause of terrorism. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for that grounding our discussion. If you go to the center, there, there were people in the center. And there's three, gen th three gentlemen, um, so I'll take the first. Thank you very much. I'm, uh, my name is Ami Jahangi. I'm from Pakistan. Um, I have two uh, uh, part of the question, actually. <clears throat> One is uh, looking at the rule of law. Uh, what would be your response on if the state is lying to its citizens? And specifically talking about the, the issue of ma weapon of mass destruction. And the second question is, what if one state is creating terrorism activities in another one, and then asking for uh, the rights of that particular terrorist to be safeguarded. I'm specifically referring to uh, Commander Gulbushan Yadin, whose case has been heard at the ICJ recently, uh, who was an Indian terrorist, uh, Indian official working in Pakistan and creating that um, terrorist activities. So we, we, maybe without reference to the particular case, <laughs> yeah. but um, I, I, I think, it, let's start with Josh in a way, it, it seems to be a question actually about what you regarded as terrorism in your office and what became something else. Um, right, so terrorism uh, is, is uh, famously um, debatable in its definition and, in, and the applications of that definition and uh, somewhat famously uh, not defined with any one authoritative uh, set of words in the U.S. code or anything like that. It's generally considered a politically uh, motivated violence. You'll hear folks add by, by non-state actors, but then of course people refer to state terrorism or state-sponsored terrorism and all begins to get quite muddy. I think what, what with those of us who, who uh, with whom I worked on it at least, uh, saw was uh, and this really goes back to the fundamentals of the rule of law, is that we believe that states should have a, a monopoly on violence. Now that applies to ordinary criminals who use violence too, but it also believes to how political change, uh, applies to how political change should be effectuated. There are all sorts of channels that we think are appropriate ones for seeking political change, but the use of violence is not one of them. And if you start from that premise, uh, it, it leads you down a road towards saying, where it, at wherever it may be happening, whatever the victims, and in fact, whatever the cause, that's why you see terrorism entrenched in various statements of international and particular uh, state authorities as something that should be uh, kind of beyond the pale, that whatever your political vision is, there are various channels to pursue it, but uh, the, the, the killing of, of civilians or others is not an acceptable way to go about it. There was a period in which in, in that, that, that was the, the push, and this was, I include in that the post-9-11 period where the UN and others re re restored focus. It's not that they'd never focused on terrorism before, but of course in the wake of that horrible event they restored their focus on it and made statements to that effect. Of course, 
politics, foreign policy has intervened in the, in the subsequent years and uh, actors uh, don't always apply, apply that to all of those with whom they may have relationships or whom they find it convenient to deploy at times. So it, it's a problem. It strikes me that the principle is well one worth reminding ourselves of because I think it's fundamentally right and it goes to who gets to use violence in society to seek change and to enforce law and who should pursue whatever their causes are, whatever their vision may be, through appropriate channels but with violence not being among those. Well, the, uh, Mr. Johnson, and then we'll go across. I'm Tom Johnson from the United States. I want to make one quick comment before I get to the question I wanted to make, that I wanted to pose, and that is whether there shouldn't be a distinction when one's talking about use of force by non-state actors between what we would all regard as civil war and terrorism. Mm -hmm. uh, they strike me as different, and I'm not sure it's useful to look at lump the civil war context into the terrorism context. But the question I really wanted to ask, and I'm gonna uh, put this forward, fully conscious of what our friend from Afghanistan just said, but I wanna start with 9-11, and of course, when you think about what's happened in Afghanistan and Iraq, just those two countries, the losses due to terrorism in the West are really quite small compared to what's happened in your country and in Iraq. Nonetheless, I think this conversation is largely focused on the reaction in Western countries to terrorism. Shortly after 9-11, certainly in the United States, there was much discussion of the difference between the law enforcement paradigm and the war paradigm. That was the way everyone talked about it. We seem to have gone well past that by this point in time. Now, the title of this conference is, of th this panel is sort of one indication of that. My question is, how well will the Western countries that have been reacting, I think everybody be, believes, more maturely, uh, more deliberately to terrorism than was the case in the early 2000s. How likely would that be to continue if we had another terrorist incident on the scale of 9-11, which we, we have not had one anywhere close to that scale since then. If it happened again, not just in the United States, anywhere in the West, and assume for a moment that Donald Trump isn't president of the United States, just sort of keep that little odd piece of the calculus out of it. What would be the reaction? So the, I, I think this is a, a helpful question for all three of you. Is, have things normalized? Um, do things go back? Or are things going to move to another level with, for, with the uh, incident that we all fear, and in some ways that hasn't, hasn't happened yet. Can I first say something? Because I think the, the remark about the difference between civil war and terrorism is, is, is a really interesting remark as well. And what you see now, and there is some, uh, some cases before the European Court of Justice actually in the LTTE case, in the Sri Lankan case, mm. Um, you see actually that the court re starts to reject the distinction between civil war and terrorism. So uh, the question was whether a party to, the ci to civil war can also be classified and blacklisted as a terrorist. That was a concrete question before the court in relation to the LTTE, the Tamil Tigers in Sri Lanka. And initially it was held that that's, uh, you, you cannot be uh, labeled terrorist if you are a party to civil war. But now the court uh, says that actually, yes, you can also identify terrorist groups uh, in uh, civil war situations, which I think, um, I mean, it's really interesting. It's obviously a very complex domain, but I think it does mean that the boundary between civil war and terrorism is becoming elusive, also from a legal point of view. Um, and then, yeah, I think, I mean, I'm, I, I realize my perspective is a Eurocentric perspective, and that is, I'm afraid, what my expertise and my research ha, uh, has been about, and it would have actually been nice, or for next year, it would probably be good to, to broaden uh, the, the perspectives on the, on the panel. Uh, Europe has always tried to reject this war paradigm. Uh, so the European Union from the beginning has tried to actually reject the, the kind of uh, post 9-11 war language and war paradigm. My position has always been 
that we shouldn't get too comfortable in Europe, right? We shouldn't uh, actually, you know, uh, critique the Americans uh, or uh, whoever else in the world and think that we are doing it uh, so, uh, everything so well, because actually I think in the name of counterterrorism, we've seen quite extensive uh, lawmaking, regulations in, inside Europe as well, some of it, um, well, I was going to say ill-considered, but let's say hasty and crisis-driven, uh, not sufficiently considered, not sufficiently thinking about precisely the question of root causes, not sufficiently uh, thinking precisely about you know, some of the distinctions, like the distinction between uh, civil war and terrorism. So, so I, have, I guess I, I do have a Eurocentric perspective, but I always try that to be an inwardly critical perspective because the EU likes to think with its rejection of the war paradigm that we are like this kind of civilizing force and actually I think we should in Europe as well reflect uh, critically inward and see uh, the extent of the kind of uh, lawmaking that we've engaged uh, with that has actually also changed our societies and that might in fact indeed if there would be another big attack um, uh, uh, shift the balance again, uh, of course, um, yes. Maybe I'll start by, by uh, agreeing with that. You know, it always struck me as something of a, a silly debate. It's like asking whether proliferation is a law enforcement problem or a military problem. Law enforcement has tools and we use them for counterproliferation. The military has tools and we use them for counterproliferation. Counterterrorism, we tend to use, we in the United States have used both tools at differing times in differing places since 9-11, but to say, one paradigm or the other struck me as something of a silly debate. And I think you're quite right that that debate has probably all for the best faded. I think one practical reason it's faded is, is as more European countries have become part of the counter-ISIS coalition in an actively military way, it has become both a law enforcement and military uh, uh, set of tools that they're bringing to, uh, to the effort as well. And it's helped to reveal that they're just tools. They're not uh, exclusive paradigms. Um, but I think that's useful that we've collectively matured in that conversation. And then to go to your, your very good question on what would happen if, if uh, there were another attack on, on the 9-11 scale, um, it's hard for me to put aside the question of leadership when answering that question, because I think leadership matters a lot. And I won't, I, this is not to speak about Trump in particular, but I think uh, citizenry is um, vulnerable in those times. Maybe the US citizenry is less vulnerable, might be somewhat less shaken now than after 9-11, but an attack of that magnitude, I think, would leave at least the US population pretty shaken, understandably so, certainly grieving. And I think there's a huge role for leadership and what leadership can direct uh, a population towards in those times. And so uh, the answer to me depends as much on what the population has experienced as the, the road that that population's leadership, but that's not just about a head of state, that's about a legislature, that's about courts, that's about local leaders, especially wherever the attack has, has occurred, framing that conversation that happens. And I think there have been moments that have shown uh, in the United States a greater sensitivity and a sort of more productive approach in the past 16 years, and I hope that those sorts of um, sorts of notes would be hit again uh, if, in, in the dialogue after an attack like that, but it's, it goes back to your point about how tough prediction is, both on the terrorism and counterterrorism side. Yeah, I think I'd largely echo uh, the comments that have been made by my uh, fellow panelists. I'm very conscious of the, the question of root causes of terrorism, and I think we could have a conference of this size to discuss that, yeah. because I think the question of so I don't at all accept that there is an easy or even useful analytical distinction to draw between civil war and terrorism. Maybe if you're trying to structure a military response or, or a political response, there might be. But in terms of looking at how the phenomenon arises, I, I'm not wholly convinced um, that there is, especially when we come down to the level of the individual. Because essentially the question of the root cause of terrorism at the level of the individual is what makes a person go out and do violence to achieve whatever it is they want, which is usually an attempt to live a particular life for themselves or, or people they care about, um, rather than use some other kind of means of doing that through political processes and so on. Maybe that they believe there is no political process that will provide them with that means, or you know, it, it may be that for personal reasons they, they feel that, that violence is the only option. But 
that is a question which applies to an individual who carries out attacks in a European city as part of a, an ISIS-sponsored or inspired attack, as it is for someone who takes part in a civil war, I think. What is it that makes individuals go and do violence? And I think there's a myriad of answers to that question and, and no, absolutely no easy solutions. Um, but I think the broader point that the experience of what gets called terrorism is dramatically different in the, between, let's say, the three or four countries that we can um, represent simply by dint of our living in them and places where, um, I, I'd use the words of one of my uh, compatriots, John Montague, who wrote after the OMA bombing in Northern Ireland, we learn to live inside ruin like a second home, places where people are just so used to the violence that it is every day. Of course, there's a dramatic different experience there of what people's expectations might be um, of, uh, of their level of security in their life and, and how you go about improving that. Um, that then, kind of in a roundabout way, brings me to this question of what would happen if there were another large-scale attack in, in Europe, say, or in the United States. And whenever I'm asked at conferences whether I'm optimistic or pessimistic, I, I, I say honestly that it really depends on the day. And there are days when I think that what we're going through, um, I think Robert Kennedy said, uh, quoting, some Greek or other, my classics aren't great, is that you know, we're seeing a slow taming of the savageness of man and making gentle of the life of this world. That's, kind of, that's the optimistic view, that that's slowly what's happening. And so on that day, I would say there would not be a response um, like what was seen in the United States and, and Europe after the September 11 attacks, if that level were to happen again. The flip side, um, on the less uh, optimistic days, and I think I'm quoting Foucault when I say that what we've seen over the second half of the 20th century, and in particular in the 21st century, and one finds some of this in Marieka's work in a much more rudimentary fashion in mine, is a refinement of the tools of oppression. In other words, the response, counter-terrorism, insofar as it does sometimes overreach today, does so, I think, in a way that's a lot more insidious than 15, 16 years ago when the response was to round up individuals in Iraq, Afghanistan, and bring them to Guantanamo Bay and detain them. We're now looking at remotely hacking people's computers and all of that sort of thing. To come to your particular question, I'd entirely echo what, what Joshua says, because ultimately in the constitutional democracies I've looked at, the decision whether or not to use military force usually lies with the executive, and they're the ones who get to, to make the decision, often with very little, for obvious strategic reasons, very little prior oversight. Um, I am conscious that while uh, I'm, not a, uh, I'm not a military expert, I do understand that many Western states, if these are the ones we're talking about, are militarily stretched in, in a very serious way, and I'm not sure that the resources there, the military resources, you would know much better than I, Josh, to launch an attack of the scale of Afghanistan or the scale of Iraq now, if that were seen as being the you know, obvious knee-jerk reaction to um, uh, a large-scale uh, terrorist attack in Europe or the United States. Um, I just don't know that the capacity is there to try and do that again in the way that it was done 15, 16 years ago. So I indicated, I'm sorry, well, I think we're, we're going to four, Kim? I, I, right. I think so. Yeah. yeah. We're, we're running out of time. I did promise this one gentleman uh, that he'd have a question. So, yep. Thank you very much. Thank you, panel, for your nice comments and uh, thoughts about the terrorism and freedom, uh, excuse me, security and freedom. Uh, Professor Marika, you talked about regulating banks to not to fund terrorism. Can you bring the mic? Closer? Yeah, my question is a bit uh, off the topic, but it's uh, in my mind that what if the government itself or the states funds the tourism? How do you regulate? Sorry, can you repeat that? How, how do you regulate if the government or the states itself fund the, funds the terrorists? Well, there are debates about Qatar nowadays, and there are some other countries in the Middle West that are accused of funding terrorism. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I, I, it, that's a very kind of explosive debate, which is, I mean, it's so hard to have reliable knowledge on what is actually going on. Uh, but let me just say one thing to interpret your question maybe slightly differently from, from, from how you pose it, um, is that what you see now, and I think 
oh, who was it? It was maybe the Manchester attacker or, or some of the, one of the recent UK attackers had actually received like housing benefits and social security payments from the government, right? So, so there's a huge question in that area of counter-terrorism financing as well. Do you, that, do you call that terrorism financing? Does the state have a responsibility uh, in relation to those kinds of money flows? Um, so maybe that's not quite the example you were thinking of, but I do think those, um, yeah, th those questions are brought into the debate uh, a little bit uh, uh, like that. Because the state, of course, <laughs> likes to think that terrorism is financed and fostered elsewhere and that it doesn't have anything to do with it. Um, which brings me back, if I may, very briefly on the, the question of root causes. Um, I mean, it's very, again, it's a very, it's a huge debate and it's very difficult to know reliable and it's very difficult to find good research actually on the root causes and like Kian said, we could have a conference this size just debating the root causes. But I just wanted to, uh, to point out that when it comes to the relationship between terrorism and the state, we've said two things on this panel. One of them is that um, the absence of a strong state can, you know, create these sort of non-governed spaces that turn out to be fertile breeding grounds, though not everything that is bred in those spaces I think is necessarily terrorist, uh, but they do sort of provide these breeding grounds. On the other hand, we've also seen and said, and the report that uh, our panel chair mentioned at the very beginning, um, says that actually a state that is too strong and that is very repressive and that curtails liberties and that curtails uh, particular types of political a space for political expression can also foster uh, extreme discontent that may lead to radicalism uh, and extremism. So, so there, um, maybe that goes a little bit to the to the argument of the skills. I don't know, but in any case. Uh, I think we should realize that both of those things are going on and both of those state responses or non-responses can actually provide this type of breeding ground that we've been talking about. So I was very heartened to see a number of hands go up uh, and I, so I'm going to try to give an opportunity for those questions but I want to respect the coffee break for those who are ready to do that. So let, let me just note some final notes and then we can continue with a few more questions and that is um, I want to remind you that in the plenary after the coffee break, there's the presentation of the World Justice Project Rule of Law Award and the Anthony Lewis Prize for Exceptional Rule of Law Journalism. Um, so if we'll continue, but if you could join me in just thanking our panelists, it would be very appreciated. You had a question, uh, the woman just in front of the last question. Hi, my name is Saskia Brechenhofer. I work at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace in Washington. And I just had a comment also, sort of a question about the point that was raised um, a number of times now about the distinction between civil wars and terrorism, and maybe to push back a little bit against what you said, um, that it doesn't necessarily matter. I agree with you that it does not maybe matter in terms of individual motivations uh, for violence, or though maybe not even in terms of the root causes, but I do think it really matters in terms of the response. And I think this goes to your point about repressive state structures. I, I do think we now see, and I look at this from a political science perspective, an increasing number of states responding to local conflicts and insurgencies and treating them as terrorism problems and sort of tapping into the international discourse on terrorism to boost up their sort of efforts to boost up the monopoly and the use of violence but therefore dismissing any potential grievances that are actually raised by these insurgencies, even if one might not agree with the tactics, by sort of framing them as, as extremists. And I think Nigeria might be, for example, a good example with the Boko Haram insurgency being framed uniquely as a terrorism problem rather than a governance problem that has, where there's actual grievances with respect to security sector abuses. Um, so I'm just wondering if you could respond to that, because I think that also has a strong rule of law dimension to it, right, when some of the problems are coming from how states are reacting to terrorism, but not necessarily only in our own societies, but also elsewhere, and so the framing of what is a civil war or the certain scene, what is a terror, terrorist problem mm. that really needs to be only responded in terms of sort of boosting the security capacity of the state. I'm curious if you could address that tension. Well, I think I, I agree with your attempt to, I think, salvage a space in which violence can be used legitimately, which is, I think, partly what you're, what, what you're doing. If you're saying, look, there are some people who use violence 
and that's a civil war and it should be treated differently to terrorism, then I think, is that what you're trying to do? No, I'm not saying that the state that they're waging a war against and as a result of the discourse that's emerged since in the last 15 years, the international community is saying that. Um, what I'm not willing to do, which I think that what your distinction does, is, prior, is uses a judgment about the legitimacy of some of the um, concerns to categorize whether it's civil war or terrorism. And I'm not willing to do that. So I'm not willing to say, well, I'm going to look at this conflict, let's, let's just use conflict broadly, and there I think some of those individuals have legitimate concerns, so that we'll call a civil war. And then I'll look at this conflict and think, well, those individuals, I don't think any of them come within the boundaries of what might be legitimate concerns, so that I'll call terrorism. And that is an inevitable consequence of trying to maintain that distinction. But my argument is that that's exactly what states are doing. No, I, I agree, but I'm, what I'm saying is that I, I neither accept what states are doing nor that someone should try and undertake that. If we were to... Uh, we're in the encore, if you like, so you know you save your best material there. <laughs> For me, I, I am not convinced that there is a usefulness to having a category of crime that is terrorism. So if I speak within a domestic context, I would say that there may be an argument that a politically motivated murder is worse than an ordinary murder. I, I don't have a strong position one way or the other. We do in some countries, the one I live in, hold that to be the case. Um, homophobia uh, or racially motivated crime can be punished more severely, but they're both murder. Perhaps one might want to argue that a terroristically motivated crime, i.e. a crime that is the violence is somehow politically motivated, is worse and should be punished more. I could get on board with that if a society wanted to do that, but um, I'm not convinced that having this separate category of terrorism as a crime is necessarily useful. And at the level of international law, I'm equally unconvinced that you know there's calls for an international crime of terrorism that the ICC could uh, could prosecute for example I'm not convinced that that would necessarily help either a short-term goal of reducing um, the pre uh, prevalence of let's say illegitimate political violence around the world or some kind of long-term goal of addressing what might be root causes of this kind of violence in the first place so I think these kind of categories which I understand as a lawyer they exist for seemingly rational reasons but I am not convinced they can be sustained, nor that they necessarily should be. Encore? <laughs> uh, just say a couple things on that. So uh, I, I uh, agree that the phenomenon you're describing is both happening in the world and worrisome, if that's sort of the, the initial point. And maybe one extreme example of it is Bashar al-Assad, who, when there were initial protests against, uh, against him, declared the protests to be terrorists, then released from mm -hmm various jails around Syria, a number of folks who I don't know, he claimed some, some had been imprisoned as being terrorists, I don't know whether they were terrorists in the first place, and then said, aha, there's a huge terrorism problem in my country now, watch how I crack down on it. So um, that's an extreme version of what you're saying, but it is problematic in even its lesser form. So um, uh, it, 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 I agree with that. The, I guess I, I see terrorism, sometimes we get, uh, uh, there are debates as to whether ISIS, especially when it had more territory under its control was, was it insurgency or was it a terrorist group? This also strikes me as tactics. Terrorism is a certain tactic. A person, it's less useful to think of a person as a terrorist and it's more useful to think of terrorism and insurgency as things that some groups do and some groups do one, some do the other. Civil war is sort of a state of being within a country based on the level of, of violence and the, 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 the role of, of government and non-government actors in engaging on it. So I do think it, it's useful to sort of tease out those, those various elements. At the same time, legal regimes do have things like specially designated global terrorists. So there are folks who use that tactic enough and in ways that are sufficiently worrisome to governments that they then do sort of put a label on them that's probably by necessity to fit them into regimes excuse me, about asset freezing and such, where you need to decide if a person is in a category or not, but the world is, is, is in some ways more complicated than just looking at those regimes and the labels they rely on probably, uh, probably leads you to think. Does that, does that, is that helpful? Can I, can I just ask, so it goes to a number of these questions. Uh, how many scenarios do you think there are um, about competing narratives? So one, this Western, uh, 
nation uh, narrative where you have an incident and we're going to ratchet up measures and is there a decrease in freedoms? And the other, I think the suggestion of it is misused, uh, the term terrorism is misused for other purposes, it's actually stifling dissent. Uh, uh, are those different scenarios? Should we, we be separating these? Uh, it's just not a question of competing narrative because it's actually uh, an abuse of the situation we described. Or Yeah, I think I'm, I think I'm with you on, on the, the last characterization. In other words, there are all sorts of invocations by states, by governments, and by those who are not governments but may want to become uh, governments or pseudo-governments of security concerns. They say, you are insecure in X, Y, and Z ways, and therefore, and then a lot follows from that, therefore you should allow me more authority to wage war abroad. Therefore, you should allow more authority to crack down on suspected criminals at home. Therefore, you should make me your next whatever, legislator, president, etc. Terrorism strikes me as one of the, the things invoked in that uh, narrative, often a misleading and, and problematic narrative. Um, but there's a, a broader family of security concerns, some valid, some exaggerated, some not valid in the first place. Uh, and therefore uh, just made up that get invoked in that way by those who seek the type of authority that citizens might turn over if they accept that narrative. Does that, yeah. does that help? Yeah. At the same time, I would say if you assume that there is an abuse of these types of regulations, then you would maybe assume that there is a, a, a quite clearly delineated intended normal use and then a boundary beyond mm -hmm. which that normal use becomes abuse. And I, think that the problem with some terrorism legislation, and if you look at the UN Security Council resolutions, for example, some of them are very broadly defined. So that also, I think, um, means that there is scope for the kind of thing that you are describing, which is that once these uh, resolutions are appropriated in particular countries, um, they, they will have these types of effects maybe of, of stifling civil society or, or being used to uh, reduce the space of civil society. And of course we can say, well, that's an abuse of what we intended. But nevertheless, some of those uh, measures and resolutions are framed so broadly that it's very difficult to say where does the, let's say, intended use stop and where does the abuse start. And I think that's that is inherent in some of the broad formulations of, of some terrorism legislation, I'm afraid. And I think the real challenge is that if you start off with a small group of individuals for a particular cause, let's assume it's a cause that's ethno-nationalist in nature, somehow bound to territory, who start off and they commit what most men and women on the streets of The Hague will consider terrorism, some violent attacks. And then this escalates and it could escalate into a civil war and then they might win the civil war and then 20 years pass and we recognize them as a legitimate government of the territory and I think that's, that's the real problem. At what point are you making the determination that a label is appropriate to apply, what flows from that and who gets to make that determination? And the nature of the contemporary international law on terrorism is that essentially state governments have agreed to support each other's determinations even though they may not entirely like to do so but they've agreed to that. So there's a, a quietening effect on the space for violent uprising, if you like, which maybe that's a good thing. But it's also the reason that there isn't a definition of terrorism in international law. One of the things holding out is that there are still some states want to preserve space for extreme uprisings that may be in, in favor of good causes and may turn out to yield, or we, yield in the long term a legitimate government. Um, yeah. There's more questions. Inter a second encore, but I, I, I'm serious. If people want their coffee, you should go ahead. It shows we're not answering them very well if we're generating <laughs> more. <laughs> I'd like to follow that up because sure. I, see the, I, I see some difficulty with any use of the word terrorism um, from the standpoint of distinguishing it from other crimes and other bad acts. Um, I'm not saying that there's no basis for it, but I think um, you know, for example, we don't have the same reaction in the States for a manufacturer who is so lax in, in product safety that million, you know, thousands of children die out of, um, we don't have the same gut reaction to that wrongdoer as we do for someone with a terrorist label on them. 
Um, and I wonder if it, you know, it, it may not be helpful. Um, it might be better to sort of turn the reaction of the population to being less upset at these terrorist acts and maybe more upset about some of the other wrongdoing that goes on in, in, the, in the civilization. Tom. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Tom, let me just, no, I, I really should, I didn't see you. So Hans, yeah, no, 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 you did have, you're on my uh, Thank you very briefly, Hans Correll, former legal counsel of the United Nations. Thank you for a very interesting discussion. I just want to make a point here. The danger here in mixing up terrorism and civil war is very, very, very serious. And the whole thing was created through the uh, concept war on terror. It's a very, very dangerous misnomer. And you have to realize that if you have terrorism as sort of an umbrella description of ordinary crimes, this is for law enforcement. This is how you deal with this. If you have a civil war, then there's a completely different legal regime. Then you have to rely on the international humanitarian law, and in particular the Geneva Conventions. So there certainly you can commit a terrorist act also if there is a civil war, but then it's a war crime and you deal with it in that context. Just by coincidence, this afternoon, the International Bar Association released a press release on the use of drones for delivery of lethal weapons. That resolution has a background paper where we have very carefully analyzed the difference between the situations when you use arms, if it is a war, when the humanitarian law applies, or when it isn't a war or a civil war, when the human rights uh, rules apply. And they allow the use of arms to a much, much lesser extent than if you use it in the battlefield. I just wanted to draw your attention to that release that came today by a coincidence. Thank you. Thank you, Hans. Since I think I start, sort of started the Civil War. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Well, thank you very much for the comment. What I want to say is actually very similar to what you're saying. When I made, made that comment about the distinction, what I had in mind was not so much whether something, a group was an insurgency or not. It was the target of the violence. That seems to me to be the key distinction. Hence, when ISIS took over Mosul, I'm not sure that was a terrorist act because the target of the violence was the Iraqi armed forces and they went in to achieve a political goal to take territory, to control it, and their enemy, the target of their violence was the armed forces of the Iraqi state. Very different when that same group launches terror attacks in London, Brussels, Paris, the United States, the difference being the target of the violence isn't the armed forces of the state they're opposing. The target of the violence is sort of randomly selected non-combatants. So to go to what Mr. Correll was saying, um, you, can have, you can have organized armed forces representative states that go out and commit terrorist acts. We call those war crimes. Um, similarly, I think you can have an insurgency, a group like ISIS, conduct warfare wholly in conformity with the Hague regulations. Um, but they can also, just like the state, so can. Uh, I, I'm just, I'm saying, it's a theoretical possibility. <laughs> Theoretically, they could. Um, but, but the target of the violence is what strikes me as the key distinction between terrorism and other uses of force, no matter who it is that's committing the other use of force. So, just to, to continue to sort of complicate the picture, I guess I'm reluctant to accept that if the distinction is that it's a military target, that that makes it not an act of terrorism. I mean, we had Fort Hood in the States, which was a military installation, military targets, I, I, I think rightly viewed as uh, an act of terrorism, though actually prosecuted somewhat differently. But uh, uh, so I, I guess we have to think hard about what types of targets one would carve out rather than seeing it as politically motivated violence in the first place. But um, clearly a complicated issue. All right, this is our, our last, last comment, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you for a very interesting discussion. 
Statistically, the number of terrorist acts in this region of the world is substantially lower than 30, 40 years ago. In this part of the world, meaning America and Europe. But discussions about counter-terrorist measures are more and more emerging now. The trend generally is to limit human rights, to limit checks on balances in some states, that is the trend is generally to decrease the judicial control of intelligence and other agencies. So my question is, what can be accessible as a price to be paid to secure the security of the nation, on the other hand, preserving some sort of human rights and rule of law in some countries? Thank you. I'm not sure I, I caught the entire, would you just repeat the question at the end? What, what is the right so, price to so pay? What's the exact price that is acceptable to pay in order to preserve some sort of balance between state security, rule of law, and human rights? So your question makes me think of a line from Aristotle that it's uh, the mark of a wise man not to demand too much precision from a discipline than that discipline is capable of providing. Uh, if, the, the, I'm tempted to give you an answer of 9.2 or something like that. <laughs> uh, it, it seems a difficult question to, to answer. I think there is a broader question that I've grappled with myself on the focus on, focus on and expenditure on um, uh, yeah. counterterrorism uh, in, in, uh, in, in the current environment. You know, terrorism statistically, especially in the West, takes uh, relatively few lives. Um, but my view, and I've written about this publicly, is that there is still very valid reason to spend a lot of resources to stop it. That's partly because our citizenry asks us to. They say we don't want to die in violent, random deaths uh, in a way that they don't ask for slippages in the bathtubs, for example, which are statistically greater in number. They want to feel secure in all the ways that terrorism makes them feel insecure, and that's, that's something the citizenry may well be entitled to demand. Uh, it's also that ter deaths from terrorism do things, I think in part due to human nature, that deaths in other ways just don't do. They lead people to have uh, fears that can change politics. As ISIS, ISIS has shown, it can change the dynamics of whole regions. Uh, it can have all sorts of effects that transcend those particular numbers and affect politics, societies, regions in, in massive ways. And so that none of that is to justify human rights abuses along the way, but if it's a question of how much focus and how much to invest, I think one has to accept that human nature reacts to terrorism certain ways, while also going to the resilience point you made earlier, doing all the things we can to, to try to moderate that reaction and try to inform that reaction and try to lead towards resilience and away from knee-jerk response. Yeah, and I think in that sense, um, the fact that we are so low tolerance for this particular type of risk that is terrorism says something about our society and the kind of security that, that we want, that we expect. So, so in that sense, it's a much broader, maybe almost cultural discussion about what we expect, what, what do we live with and what do we not live with. I mean, the risk ultimately of dying of gun death or a traffic accident is much, much greater. Um, but nevertheless, I think we should keep asking questions of effectiveness and proportionality in terms of how much money does the government invest. And, and there I think we are really lagging behind. I mean, if you look at questions of effectiveness, uh, personally I think they're, they're not nearly asked enough uh, about terrorism legislation. Does this actually work? Uh, is it cost effective in terms of all the money spent? In terms of also, you know, when I go back to my example of the financial industry and the money they spend on compliance, is enormous and that would definitely be justified if it was actually working but there we have very little measure of actual effectiveness we have insufficient knowledge of what works and what doesn't work and there I do worry uh, both as a, as a citizen and a political scientist about uh, are we sufficiently asking these questions of effectiveness and cost effectiveness I agree with both Joshua and Rebecca, but I would say that I think implicit in your question is that we are paying too high a price in agenda setting, and if that is implicit in your question, then I would agree. This, is take, this takes up a lot of space in governmental talk, and there, what terrorized me today was a piece I saw on my laptop just before coming in here, that a very large chunk of Antarctica just broke off and started drifting away, and you know, that is an agenda that is Go, David is a, a climate change lawyer, amongst other things. That is an agenda that is high up our ladder as an international community. How much higher would it be if we had a more moderated approach to the fact that uh, we live with a degree of risk about 
things that people might do to us violently in the name of politics. There, there are other things that have suffered, I think, in our 21st century global governance agenda. And in that, I agree with you for sure that the price we paid is too high. We have circled another bend in the Mississippi. <laughs> Thank you very much. Please join me. Thank you.